Um, so again, uh, my name is Taylor Edema. I'm uh, actually a product manager for uh, Palo Alto Networks. Uh, I've been with them for a little while now. Uh, before that, I worked uh, at uh, one of the big five defense contractors doing uh, electronic warfare uh, R&D programs, which um, electronic warfare is basically kind of the radar version of, of all of the, uh, the cyber war stuff that you uh, hear about a lot. And, uh, but those two are crossing paths more and more nowadays as everything ends up getting to RF at some point or another, it seems. Uh, but uh, uh, interesting stuff. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Um, today, uh, what I thought I'd do is I put some charts together to look at, uh, uh, take a closer look at some modern malware trends, uh, what we're seeing, their, their capabilities evolving into, uh, what the back channels look like uh, on an application-aware appliance. Um, We'll be looking at some data also at a statistical level, some data we collected from Wildfire, which is a, a service we launched back in November of last year. Um, uh, so I'll just give a quick overview of that service uh, in, uh, in a little bit. I'll also take a closer look at uh, one of the uh, very targeted, uh, targeted attacks we've seen recently uh, in, this, in the SCADA realm, actually, uh, and, and what that looks like, and, and uh, a quick overview of some, some recent SCADA events as well. Um, there was a very good uh, SCADA specific talk actually in this room a few hours ago, which is really good. I recommend you check it out if you missed it. Um, and so with that, we'll get started. Uh, just want to do a quick introduction of uh, the service we call Wildfire. Uh, I promise I left my sales hat at home. This is not a sales pitch at all. Uh, I just wanted to introduce the technology so you know where the data is coming from that we're uh, going to talk about. Uh, so Wildfire is a, a cloud-based sandboxing environment, uh, sandboxing malware, uh, looking for the behaviors it performs on the host, uh, doing automatic determination as to whether or not it's uh, benign or malicious uh, binary, uh, and it does a number of things to do that. Uh, so this is kind of an overview of the flow here. Um, <clears throat> sandboxing by itself, of course, is nothing new. There's nothing novel strictly about sandboxing. Everyone's got different techniques. Everyone's looking for different things and doing different things with that data, but somewhere between automated uh, verdict determination, you know, is it bad or good, um, to just plain raw forensics uh, data collection. Uh, what makes this particular setup a, a little bit unique is that this is uh, the first time, to our knowledge, that basically a sandbox uh, like this and of this capability has been added as a capability uh, within a firewall whereby networks that deploy this firewall can send up suspicious files to the service um, practically in real time and that allows us to collect some very interesting data, um, very good data, not honeypot based data, but you know stuff that's hitting real world uh, customer and enterprise networks. Uh, so the malware basically is, is caught on the firewall, or the, the samples I should say before there's a determination made. Uh, it's sent up to the sandbox uh, in our data centers, it's analyzed. Uh, we'll let it phone home and do all that internet stuff that it wants to do, uh, which is very important for, for malware to be able to talk to the internet uh, from a sandboxing perspective. Uh, uh, we see uh, behaviors, um, a very common behavior for example is that that malware will, fir will first reach out to a Microsoft.com or a Google.com, make sure it's got internet connectivity before it starts to do anything bad. Uh, once the internet check checks out, um, it'll go to you know, an IP checking website, what is my IP.com, something like that to try and get its external IP address, find out where it's running. And only after that second check uh, checks out will it actually start to execute uh, uh, what it's really designed to do, uh, first and foremost usually, is phoning back home, talking to its true command and control servers uh, back uh, you know, under the attacker's control. So let's take a look at some of the data we were able to collect. Uh, this was over a one month period earlier in the year, I believe this was uh, April 2012. Uh, during that time, uh, we discovered uh, just under 16,500 uh, unique new malware samples uh, in the networks that were installed, that the service was deployed on. Uh, so those are unique uh, new malware samples, not counting duplicates, uh, this is by file hash. Um, and of those over 16,000, um, a full two-thirds of those samples were not detected by any of the top six endpoint AV products that we routinely monitor for detection. Uh, this is not using virus total data. Uh, for those of you familiar with virus total, uh, you know, virus total is, is very good at doing what it does, but you only get a 100% confirmation that something is or is not detectable if that sample has actually been uploaded to virus total. Um, so for that reason, uh, we've basically built uh, our own sort of mini virus total light capability. Uh, looking at a subset of those, basically the, the who's who of, of endpoint AB products. And, uh, and that's how we came up with that, that two-thirds number. So um, to some, it's a total shocker. To others, it's, it's not, not really at all surprising. And this is kind of where we find ourselves today in the state of um, sort of static signature-based malware detection. 
Uh, not to say that it, it's going away or it should go away. It's been there forever. It'll probably always be there. Uh, it's part of certainly a defense in-depth strategy. Uh, but this is simply uh, where we are today uh, with techniques that are readily available to everyone to, to pack and obfuscate malware to get around static signatures, um, server-side polymorphism. Uh, every 30 minutes or even every single time malware is pulled down from a server uh, hosting it, it's, it's uh, repacked to, to evade detection. Uh, the next pie chart over, uh, we see that uh, also of those over 16,000 uh, malware samples, 80% uh, generated some sort of network activity. Uh, this shouldn't really come as much of a surprise either, right? This is malware, the whole name of the game now is, is sabotage, IP, theft, uh, data exfil. You need the network to do those things, remote control. Uh, you need to be able to get in and get out communications. And so the only way to do that, obviously, is, is, is to have that network communication. Now, of the, those 80%, uh, a full 60% almost of malware samples exhibited what we'd call um, evasive traffic. So let's look at what evasive traffic looks like. Um, some of these aren't strictly evasive, but they're just interesting, but we just put them all up here uh, just for uh, completeness. Um, that first category is by far the most popular. This is short HTTP headers. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, for those familiar with what HTTP headers look like, um, legitimate clients like web browsers and Java and those kinds of things uh, typically have your long, very verbose um, looking HTTP headers. Most malware, you know, pe people s pull together some real quick uh, HTTP based command and control protocols and they maybe only have one or two header fields or three, the bare minimum just to get the traffic flowing. Uh, so short HTTP headers is often a, a, a giveaway that, that something's running that, that on the network that probably shouldn't be. The next category over, uh, unknown traffic. Uh, we determine, or the way we classify unknown traffic is we run it through uh, our protocol and application layer uh, decoders. And so these are running on, on all ports, all protocols all the time, and trying to identify, you know, is this HTTP, um, IRC, SMTP, those types of things. Uh, and then we'll go uh, one level up and, and try and identify the specific application. If traffic fails to meet any of those criteria and it's unknown, uh, we'll dump it in the unknown bin, which you, know, you want to take a real close look at that traffic when it's unknown and, and possibly control that traffic if you're interested in controlling uh, modern malware. So unknown traffic, when we go into to customer sites and we see unknown traffic on the network, which we nearly always do, uh, it's always one of two things. It's either custom in-house software, proprietary software for which we have no knowledge of, and, and so they'll have to go you know, write signatures specifically to identify their software. Um, or number two, and more commonly, is it's malware running on the network. It's using proprietary protocols, it's using proprietary encryption, um, simply doing a, a byte of XORing across the thing. Um, anything to just sort of evade anything that can do any kind of smart scanning on that web traffic. Uh, the next category over, use of dynamic DNS, fast fluxing. These have been around for a while. Um, they're pretty popular, uh, you know, for anti-takedown attempts, uh, anti-blacklisting um, uh, techniques, and so on and so forth. And then we get into uh, fake HTTP is the next most common. Uh, what we call, what we mean here by fake HTTP is basically non-HTTP running over the standard HTTP port. So um, anything that's not RFC compliant web traffic over port 80, 443, 8080, all those ports, um, just to evade uh, strict, full, uh, strict stateful inspection firewalls, uh, just to get that traffic out the door. It's something totally different, but it's running over those ports that everyone knows are open. Uh, then we see the converse of that, which is uh, HTTP over non-standard ports. Uh, so they want to leverage HTTP. It's a great protocol. It's great for command and control. It's easy. Win32 APIs are out there to help you out. Uh, but they want to use non-standard ports uh, just to get around, you know, appliances or security devices that might be there looking at specific predefined ports uh, to do their, their threat scanning on. Uh, so, uh, you know, you might have, for instance, uh, snort rules looking for specific command and control patterns, but the first part of that rule you say, well, that, that's only looking at HTTP ports, and that's a predefined variable you've got there that has a limited set of ports that it's looking at. So that's why they do that. Uh, and then those last two categories, um, IRC on, on standard and non-standard ports uh, used to be pretty common. It's still out there a little bit, but not nearly as much as it used to be, um, just because it's a red flag. Uh, there's not really too many more legitimate uses of IRC in today's enterprise environment. Uh, and if you see it, uh, it's, it's, it is usually a red flag, so not as popular as, as it used to be. Uh, so going back to the AV coverage question, uh, this is a little bit of a histogram here uh, showing the first one week of, of AV coverage stats. So this is starting from day zero when uh, our wildfire service uh, first detects brand new, never before seen malware 
and then going seven days past that, um, this is sort of the breakdown that we see. It's a pr pretty typical breakdown of, of how AV vendor coverage changes over time. Um, and so this was, I believe, yeah, this was taken from uh, January of this year. So um, pretty much what we expected to see, almost you know, very little coverage up front, um, and uh, then the coverage starts to fill in over time. Uh, sometimes, however, we'll see samples that get covered um, weeks or even months later, sometimes never, simply because either they're extremely targeted, they never touch AV vendor honeypots, or they're never seen on an endpoint with an AV product that is able to do anything with it. Uh, so there's a variety of reasons why that might happen. Uh, we also did a couple uh, experiments just for the fun of it to see what this traffic from some of these malware samples that we see with wildfire look like if you're looking at it uh, uh, through the firewall's point of view. Uh, so we took a couple samples. We'll start with what we call Trojan example or sample number one. Um, and this just gives you kind of an overview of the types of behaviors we observed uh, that malware to do. I don't know if you can see it in the back or not. Um, but it lit up our system like a Christmas tree. I mean, there was just uh, almost every behavior that we look for, this, this basically did it. Um, anything from uh, you know, messing with the security and proxy settings of the web browser, uh, creating and installing drivers and services, uh, starting executables and processes from the uh, user document folder, things like that, that typically are not found in legitimate software. Uh, it also did, on the networking side, a couple, a couple behaviors. You can see those arrows pointing to uh, connecting to a non-standard uh, HTTP port uh, and also producing unknown traffic over the HTTP, HTTP port. So let's take a look at that network traffic. Uh, you open it up in Wireshark. Okay, you see it kind of scanning through ports on the source side, hopping around a little bit on the destination side. Most of the sessions by far around the 1K range, uh, pretty typical for polling, phoning home, getting new commands, uh, very lightweight traffic. Uh, a couple sessions there, definitely uh, uh, to note, uh, roughly in the three to 500K range, which is pretty much a, a giveaway that, okay, it's now pulling down second stage or updating itself. Uh, let's take a look at what that traffic looks like. Uh, so we basically took the PCAPs from that malware uh, during its analysis session uh, time frame in, in Wildfire, and we replayed it through the appliance, uh, and we looked at the logs, and we started to get a feel for, you know, how would this look from an operator's point of view if they had no idea that this was running, um, if, if they weren't running a service like, like Wildfire looking at what that malware was doing. Um, you can start to see here on the application category, uh, or application column, um, the, the, uh, the apps that it was running, uh, it kind of oscillated between you know, DNS, web browsing, unknown TCP. DNS, web browsing, unknown TCP. Uh, and, and so let's take a look at what, and that, that unknown uh, TCP there, uh, let's take a look at what that session was. And we open up the PCAP and almost immediately, anyone that's seen this before, you know exactly what you're looking at. You got the MS-DOS MZ header in there with the dead giveaway string. Uh, and so basically this is just opening up a raw socket and pumping out uh, a binary to either update itself or, or pull down additional capabilities, another rat tool, something like that. Um, and and uh, it was over a standard HTTP port. So yet another example of how, you know, without doing any additional inspection, if you just have open ports, it allows malware that's gotten into your network somehow already to pull down second stage uh, capabilities. Uh, let's take a quick look at one more. Uh, we'll call this Trojan sample number two. Um, we'll look at the logs that it produces uh, on the firewall. And we see a couple things here that are a little bit out of the ordinary. We see uh, web browsing uh, over uh, high, the high uh, restricted or ephemeral ports. Uh, we also see unknown UDP over the DNS port 53, which also is highly suspicious. Um, and we take a look at, let's take a look at the uh, port 53 traffic uh, in Wireshark. And we see Wireshark's parser crank on it, and the questions and answers, the numbers are uh, you know, off the charts, ridiculous, not real. And then later on, the, the parser would, of course, crash on it because it's not at all valid DNS. And if we were to take a look at this one, uh, the PCAPs of this one, just a raw PCAP, it's basically the same exact kind of thing. It's downloading second stage malware, tunneling through the uh, D open DNS port. Now that's if the attacker is trying to make it e easy for you. This is, this is the easiest thing to do, is just try and get through an open port with totally bogus non-DNS data. Uh, a little bit more of a sophisticated attacker might do something like this, DNS tunneling, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, it's totally RFC compliant DNS traffic. It's using text records and uh, uh, recursive queries to an attacker controlled DNS server and tunneling full TCP data through DNS. It's a great way to get free Wi-Fi at the airports if you want to set up your own DNS server. Um, 
but it's also very convenient and handy to basically funnel in anything you want over uh, the DNS port. Even if you are looking specifically for DNS, you have to have sort of another layer of intelligence also looking for, you know, is this actually legitimate DNS or is this one of these uh, example applications you see on the left side there um, that, that really aren't legitimate DNS. Uh, a quick look at Kilios, just by show of hands real quick, how many people are, would say they're very familiar with Kilios? Okay, good. So a couple, but I uh, just want to make sure I'm not wasting uh, everyone's time with a little bit of, little bit of backstory here. So Kilios um, has been around for a while in various permutations. Um, the reason I'm talking about today is, is we do pick up a ton of Kilios intercepts since we are basically uh, a sensor in, in customer networks and, and uh, and the threat team is able to take a look at, at, at new malware, including new uh, Kilios variants. Uh, so this particular botnet's had a, a long history. Uh, started as Storm, then Waladek, then Kilios. Um, the, the, the name of the game here really is farm spamming. It, it just does farm spamming as its you know, main uh, profit maker. Um, it can also do DDoSing uh, and drop additional malware. It's had a long command and control evolution. Uh, it started out as basically um, leveraging an eDonkey-like peer-to-peer protocol, uh, migrated to XML over HTTP, and then migrated to um, serialized objects over HTTP. Uh, there's been several takedown attempts. Each one has been moderately successful for that malware that day, but then the new variant is compiled and put into production and circulation hours later, and we've seen that several times now. So um, it's still there, it's there today. It's, it's um, doing what it does best. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, how does it propagate? Uh, well, the same methods it's used the whole, uh, this whole time, as well as a couple new new methods. So, we've seen the social engineering emails, we've seen infected websites, um, it harvests email addresses from infected hosts, all of that stuff. Um, we also saw it use a targeted Facebook camp, or not targeted, a Facebook campaign after the numbers were taken way down after that CrowdStrike takedown in March. Um, there was a huge Facebook campaign launched, uh, uh, basically infecting people through malicious wall posts. Uh, it was very successful. Uh, we also saw them um, pay off uh, five stock botnet to get their numbers up. And we also saw through wildfire a lot of malware out there that was totally unrelated and totally unrelated campaigns with nothing previous to do with, with Kilios, um, starting to drop the Kilios botnet on infected hosts as well. So, um, you know, you can never be too surprised really, but it's just another example of of different groups being associated with different groups, making certain deals and, and getting uh, their payloads dropped uh, if they know the right people and, and uh, pay the right amount of money. Uh, also, another interesting uh, addition in the latest variant uh, was the inclusion of the uh, .LNK Microsoft exploit, the 2010 uh, uh, 2568 CVE. Um, this was made world famous by Stuxnet. For those of you who are familiar with Stuxnet, this is one of the propagation methods Stuxnet used. At, at that time, it was an O-Day. Um, it's, it's no longer anymore. Um, but this allows you to propagate and affect other machines just by inserting a USB stick with the malicious link file on it, a malicious shortcut, um, even if you have auto run disabled on the, on the host, which most PCs now, the default configuration of Windows, uh, and in certainly in secure environments, they make sure that auto run is disabled. Uh, so even with auto run disabled, this allows you to, to infect that host just by sticking the, the USB stick in. Um, as with a lot of malware in this type of category, uh, we see the focus is on um, uh, evasion rather than anti-analysis. Anti-analysis is just not their priority uh, for these particular actors. Um, uh, in terms of uh, evasion, uh, we see use of uh, packers. Uh, they migrated from UPX to a custom packer. Um, uh, we've seen the payloads change every 30 minutes. Uh, so the emphasis is on evading the traditional AV uh, signature-based detection. Um, in terms of the anti-analysis, again, we saw the, the B variant uh, with their custom packer put in a couple anti-debug tricks. Um, in the .C, uh, at least from the samples we found, uh, there were basically no uh, anti-analysis tricks in there whatsoever. It was, it was pretty easy to start just digging in and picking it apart. Um, and in persistence, it's not particularly stealthy either. It's basically just right there in the registry. Um, there is no hijacking of legitimate processes or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward uh, once it's on the endpoint. In terms of capabilities and how those have evolved, uh, <clears throat> again, it's, it's primarily spamming botnet. It has been, it is today. Um, a DDoS client as well. Uh, so it'll do, host, it'll do host OS detection. So if it's running on, for, ex for instance, uh, Service Pack 2, Windows XP and earlier, um, it knows it can get a raw socket and do SYN flooding. 
Uh, if it's running a later operating system, it knows it, it can't do that, and it'll just do, uh, at the user level anyway, it'll just do uh, uh, connection-based uh, flooding. Um, and the more uh, interesting things, uh, it'll actually do a full libpcap install and start monitoring the, FM the FTP, SMTP, POP3 uh, ports, stealing credentials to, to of course, further uh, propagate itself. Um, it also is, uh, uh, makes good use of, of uh, open source libraries. Um, the libpcap we just talked about, uh, Boost, uh, Crypto++. Crypto++ not used just for encrypting its own phone home communication, but it actually use it to uh, decrypt any FTP, encrypted FTP passwords that might be stored on the host um, by, by local FTP clients. And it'll use those to log into those websites that that, that person might, uh, might oversee and turn those websites into proxies to launch further infections, uh, to uh, host additional payloads, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, Bitcoin stealing also is, has um, uh, made its way into the latest variant. Uh, not just Bitcoin uh, wallet stealing, which, I mean, let's be honest, not too many people have Bitcoin wallets uh, nowadays, but doing the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin mining uh, is, is big business in the botnet circle now. Um, not only taking advantage of CPU cycles, but GPU as well, using the massively parallel uh, computing capabilities of GPUs to do those work at home, pro uh, show your work problems. Um, uh, that you need to do to, uh, to mine Bitcoins. So pretty cool stuff there on the Kilio side. Some of that's been published. Uh, you might have seen some of that earlier, um, but uh, it's, it's always changing a, a little bit, and so we like to keep track of that stuff. Um, now a quick look at switching gears a little bit to the industrial, contro industrial control system, ICS and SCADA uh, environments. Um, uh, it's it's uh, definitely got a lot of people's attention. Um, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, uh, just put out uh, a study uh, a few months ago that in 2011, uh, SCADA cyber intrusions spiked uh, five-fold over the year previous. Uh, and so it's, it's got a lot of people's attention. Um, it was put out by DHS, which runs TSA, so take it with a grain of salt. But they're probably right about this. It's, uh, it is a legitimate problem. Um, so won't spend too much on the flame Stuxnet issue. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have read at length uh, about it, um, but just wanted to cover very briefly what its capabilities were, how it spread, um, you know, what does persistence look like nowadays? What do quote unquote advanced capabilities look like nowadays? Just to level set everyone so that when we talk about a, another campaign, um, you can kind of compare it uh, uh, to these types of campaigns. So. Uh, Flame, for, for people that have been really following this stuff, a lot of the experts uh, tend to agree that Flame was probably actually the precursor to Stuxnet, uh, even though it was discovered much later. Uh, it was, uh, it's, it's um, speculated to be basically the information gathering uh, stage of a campaign uh, like Stuxnet, um, doing the recon work. So um, it, it uh, did a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of intel gathering, a lot of recon, had over 20 modules that could be loaded and unloaded, did things like recording the audio from the PC's microphone, um, we can monitor Skype calls, take screenshots, key logging. Um, it would turn itself into a Bluetooth beacon and try and suck data from everyone's Bluetooth devices and phones in the room. Um, also would look specifically for uh, AutoCAD files, uh, PDFs and text files, so these are things that um, it's, they're useful for determining, okay, what kind of uh, SCADA environment am I looking at? Uh, you know, any design documents related to where I'm running, that kind of thing. Um, so that was Flame, and then Stuxnet, which, which occurred uh, arguably later, but was discovered earlier, uh, <clears throat> of course, was what did a lot of the interesting things. Um, let's get rid of that real quick. Um, just to what it did, which was, uh, why, you know, why is it interesting, first of all, was the first uh, malware that, that people are aware of that actually manipulated and overwrote uh, PLC code, Programmable Logic Controller code. Uh, so that by itself is, is pretty remarkable. Um, also remarkable is its uh, specific conditions that it required to run. Um, this is a perfect example of extremely targeted uh, malware that, that took many resources to identify exactly where they wanted to run. So it's looking for uh, the presence of a specific SCADA system, uh, uh, a specific uh, variable frequency drive manufactured by just two vendors, one of which was based in Iran. Uh, and they was even looking at the current RPM rate of their centrifuges, making sure they were specifically within something like 850 hertz to 1200 hertz. Um, so basically exactly where they wanted to run is the only place that the malware would actually do what it was designed to do. And of course it was designed to 
um, modulate the uh, RPMs of the centrifuges to eventually uh, destroy them. Um, the command and control pattern at the bottom uh, is uh, pretty typical, if you remember what I was saying earlier about the stages of that command and control traffic and how they start to test the waters and phoning home. Um, this is basically exactly what, what Stuxnet did as well, checking Windows Update, uh, checking msn.com, and then reaching out to the true command and control domains, which were, um, of course, socially engineered themselves uh, to, to look like they wouldn't stand out in a, in a URL log at, at an organization like this. So transitioning from those examples to something that, that we found recently uh, uh, at, a, at a particular network, uh, this was a, a major raw materials manufacturer in Central Asia. Uh, we found um, a pretty sophisticated uh, industrial espionage and exfiltration uh, sample of malware. Um, it was a spear phishing email made to look like someone that the victim knows very well. Um, the attachment was very relevant to the time frame that this was discovered. Uh, it, uh, it was named uh, the end of uh, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, which is basically at the exact same time all the serious stuff was exploding. Um, and usually when we see malware in, in wildfire, the vast majority of it is seen by anywhere between um, roughly 10% to 25% of all the firewalls that, that we have monitoring. Um, and this one, this one sample, there was a single session from the single network and was never seen uh, anywhere else again. So right there, it kind of you know, emphasizes, you know, maybe we should take a look at this. Um, technically, uh, on, on, on the technical side, there was no packer used at all, um, which again, is, is pretty common actually to the really targeted attacks. Um, you know you're not gonna have any AV coverage for something that you just built uh, specifically for this organization. It's all custom stuff, 100%. And packing it really draws attention to yourself a lot of the time. I mean, uh, there's software out there, there's techniques out there looking at, um, at bit entropy and things like that. You can tell pretty easily that this is not a run-of-the-mill executable and that there's a packer used. And why do that if you don't need to? There's just no point. Uh, it injected code into standard processes and Notepad and the default browser to stay uh, persistent uh, with very little um, to sort of bring attention to itself. Uh, the C2 was in Lebanon, which is a country in the area. Um, and its capabilities were, uh, were fairly uh, remarkable. Uh, again, we see the uh, remote recording of PC, PC audio. Uh, we see standard RAT functionality, full shell access, um, installing and running new software, uh, messing with the file system, uh, data exfil, that kind of thing. Uh, we also see um, pretty sophisticated uh, recon type functions, so uh, profiling the host it's running on in the wired and wireless network and doing so uh, quite pervasively, so doing full uh, string capture on the entire hardware and software environment, uh, looking uh, for its Mac and every other Mac it can find, uh, same with the wireless, uh, so uh, pretty interesting stuff there. Um, and then what really got us going on this was that it specifically searched for ARC files and for um, People in the SCADA community uh, might ring a bell more so than others, but ARC is uh, basically uh, an extension that some SCADA software gives to compressed uh, PLC images, basically. So by looking for ARC files, you're essentially looking at what is running on this industry, on this company's PLCs, um, both uh, uh, for sabotage purposes potentially, for IP theft, for, for various reasons that you might want to get just a full image of exactly what's running on that SCADA infrastructure. Also targeted TeamViewer. Uh, TeamViewer uh, is just you know a, a remote desktop access basically. Um, it also tends to be used heavily in these types of environments as well. Uh, you have workstations that are connected to sensitive hardware uh, or to PLC programming stations, things like that, uh, that are in lab environments that might be inconvenient to be in 100% of the time. So there's a lot of remoting in to these types of environments that have all of this equipment set up. So they you know just team view in, uh, and then they're they're good to go and continue on development or administration. Uh, of the SCADA environment. So specific targeting of TeamViewer was, was also of interest from a, from a SCADA point of view. Uh, what got our threat engineers very interested is that it promptly identified our uh, Ring Zero hooks and uh, profiled them and sent up the name of the, at the time, the open source Ring Zero hooking we were using in the, serv in the uh, service, sent that up to the, uh, the attacker as well. Uh, so definitely it, it knew what it was doing. Um, after this targeted attack, things were cool for, for several uh, weeks or months, I forget which, but very little activity. Uh, and then a couple months later, we started to see uh, a slew of this 
uh, type of malware running uh, or, or being uploaded to VirusTotal. So we thought that was interesting. We took a look at those uh, and, it, and did a little more research. And it turns out, well, this is now um, sold in a cracked form as the Arcom rat uh, in various uh, hacker forums. And um, without some of the capabilities mentioned earlier. So it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. We're not sure which came first, uh, but we do know that the, that the one that was discovered in this SCADA environment uh, was uh, engineered specifically for that uh, type of environment as opposed to the, the more widely available one that we can find online now. Um, that graphic at the bottom there is, a, is an IDA look at, uh, at the command and control handling. Um, so it's just a giant staircase, a giant if else, basically, looking at the command code, essentially, from the attacker uh, to perform any one of the 40 plus uh, activities we saw it capable of performing. So um, definitely more than your average uh, uh, remote access or even specific uh, uh, targeted malware campaigns. Uh, so you know, what are the threats specifically to, to ICS? Um, <clears throat> at this level, at, the, at this technical level, uh, there's not that much that's really unique uh, to ICS and SCADA. Um, you know, it's malware running on the network. It's got to get in somehow. It's got to get out somehow. At this level, there's, there's not a lot of difference going on. What is different is why is it particularly vulnerable? And there's a lot of reasons why, why it's particularly vulnerable. First and foremost, it was just a product of its era. Um, it more or less started in, in the 60s, and in a lot of cases, it was double E's putting on their programming hat and, and taking a crack at, at this stuff. And security was just not a priority at the time. Um, there was a lot of emphasis placed on the fact that you'd have an air-gapped network. Um, as we'll see in the next chart, that may or may not really be the case. Um, most of the threats were, at the time at least, uh, insider-based. Uh, a lot of insider attacks. There's a lot of assumption that there's no value in going after SCADA systems, which is certainly not the case anymore either. Um, there was um, a lot of thought that, hey, security through obscurity. No one's familiar with these you know, obscure protocols that, that no one knows about except for our tight-knit club, which is not so tight-knit anymore. There's conferences, there's published vulnerabilities, there's, you know, if you want to learn anything you want to learn about uh, uh, DNP3 or Modbus, you know, you, you're minutes away from all the material you'd need to, to successfully uh, implement uh, uh, that protocol. So I mentioned that, um, you know, that, that whole relying on air gaps, the air gap quality of skating networks. That's true some of the time but not 100% of the time. So this actually was a, a project developed by uh, Mr. Leverett at uh, Cambridge. It was presented at the uh, Digital Bond S4 conference earlier this year. Um, and he built a tool that just automatically just scanned the web, finding uh, SCADA systems that were directly behind public IP addresses. And he integrated with Google Maps, which is cool all the time, of course. Um, and he conveniently used uh, uh, red and green pins for uh, uh, um, SCADA software that was and was not vulnerable to published uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, so there's a lot of red there, as you can see. Um, and 17% uh, required no authentication when he interrogated these services. Now, at this level, it's impossible to tell automatically you know, which ones are honeypots versus uh, you know, true vulnerable systems that are actually in charge of critical infrastructure versus uh, some random whatever. Uh, but he did sample, he did, uh, sample a few of these and did find some very interesting, somewhat high profile SCADA systems that were directly accessible uh, by public IP. Um, and they've since been working with the people involved here and trying to mitigate that. Um, but, uh, and that's not even counting, you know, the, the SCADA networks that aren't really air gapped. They're, they're segmented, then there's a VPN into some other network, which has a connection to a larger network, and then a microwave link to a remote site with a shed that doesn't have a lock on it with some workstation sitting there that's running Windows XP. Uh, and then, by the way, you have employees from home that can VPN into that. So lots of different links in the chain um, that, that can be pretty weak. So relying on, uh, on air gap networks is, is not necessarily uh, a wise thing to do. This, of course, this picture minus the meme text on it. Um, you basically can't read an article about Stuxnet without seeing this image. Uh, and so obviously, even if you are, let's say you're 100% air gapped, I mean, they found a way into this guy's network, and uh, uh, you never know who's bringing what in over USB sticks and, and what have you. Uh, one more interesting thing related to ICS and SCADA. Uh, 
one of the DHS organizations is uh, CERT, um, specifically uh, ICS CERT, that, that kind of handles responses to critical um, ICS issues. Um, and periodically they'll put out these notices to critical infrastructure owners when there's some new massive cyber intrusion campaign that they're detecting from some nation state or, or some other actor. Um, and they're all uh, typically unclassified for official use only. They always leak to the media. Uh, some of these are written about, others are just sort of ignored. Uh, but there was one in particular that, uh, that went out recently uh, about a gas pipeline sector intrusion. Uh, and it's, it's remarkable how much cooperation now, how much inf information ICS and critical infrastructure owners are getting uh, from, from organizations like these. There's specific information about, about specific artifacts to look for on the network, for example. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's definitely helpful, it's better than nothing. But the interesting thing that caught our attention and a lot of other people's attention is the uh, advice or the recommendation now that DHS is giving to the critical infrastructure owners, which is if you see uh, an intrusion campaign, um, log pervasively, log everything you can, capture everything you can, find out as much as you can passively, uh, but do not kick out the attackers. Uh, unless critical infrastructure is in imminent danger. So pretty interesting stuff. It's, it's sort of a, a little bit of shift in what people are used to and what you'd expect the response to be. Um, but uh, you, know, you take another look at this and you start to realize exactly why they would want you to go about it this way. Um, they want to learn just as much as the attacker wants to learn. They want to learn who they are, what their tools are, um, how to better offend or defend and, 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 and use this information in other, in other ways. So. Um, so pretty interesting. Uh, so in, uh, in a little bit of a recap, let's look at you know, the threat space. Uh, how has the landscape changed? Uh, how has it stayed the same? Um, the attacker, to some extent, has, has changed or grown uh, more advanced. I mean, you hear the advanced persistent stuff, sure. Um, that's, that's certainly the case. We've, we've heard that. Uh, but also the attack strategy has evolved to some extent. Um, if you're going after data in a database, you don't just slam the database. You have to go low and slow. You social engineer an employee that may not even have access. You hop lily pads throughout the network. You finally get after what, what you're after, and then you get out. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit different than it used to be. Um, the migration from self-replication to controlled release is also very important for this type of attacker. Uh, so, I mean, unless you're trying to do a broad attention-getting spam campaign or, or a DDoS campaign or sort of the more hacktivist type campaigns, um, it's to your advantage to go low and slow and to, to specifically uh, release your payloads to the specific people that you're after rather than have these sort of self-replicating, um, highly visible spreading type of, uh, of malware payloads. Um, the techniques themselves uh, have also changed to, to a degree. Um, certainly, there's, there's still a Windows Vulns out there, but by and large, um, the OSs uh, are getting harder, um, so that's good. Um, but then that means you shift your focus elsewhere. So rather than go after the OS, attackers go after the, the soft spots, uh, browser Vulns, uh, browser helper Vulns, Java Vulns. These are all things that you can get at through the browser. Um, tons of soft spots, and they're getting hit over and over again. Um, you know, PDF is number one. I mean, tons of PDF exploits. Um, Java is making the news over and over again. We saw another Java come out uh, yesterday, I think it was, another Java O-Day that affects every platform. Uh, so, uh, you know, don't make your job harder than it needs to be. Go after, go after what's easy. Um, avoidance of traditional AV signatures. We've been talking about this. So it's... With the toolboxes that are available nowadays, it's, it's almost trivial in a lot of ways to get around the static signature stuff um, and, and just sort of uh, repack, obfuscate, do what you need to do to get around it. Uh, it's it's, it's not, that, not that difficult. Um, and hiding communications, we saw examples of that as well. Using non-standard ports, proprietary encryption, um, anything to get around appliances that aren't you know, able to look for that and block the unknown stuff. Uh, so what's the same? Uh, there, lots the same, really. I mean. Vulnerabilities, remotely exploitable vulnerabilities, insider threat, unaware users that don't know, uh, that don't have a security conscious mind. Um, you know, no one's breaking the laws of physics here, much less computer science. So at, at the end of the day, those things are always going to be there. That's the way it is. It's the way, uh, uh, you know, it has been and will be for, for quite a while. Um, and that's all I had prepared for today. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, open it up to uh, questions.
Malware in a what environment? Oh, uh, specifically with wildfire? Right, so, so today uh, the, the service runs in a specific environment uh, with specific supported file types, and so, um, you know, if it can't run, it can't run. Um, we're not, uh, in our particular product, we're not proxying anything, we're not blocking anything the first time it tries to get through, so and the, in that case it would basically be a no-op. Um, of course, we're always looking for ways to, uh, to increase the number of platforms we support and the number of uh, file types we support and those types of things. Um, but, but uh, yeah, if it can't run, it can't run. Anything else? All right, thank you very much.